Better Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Lustig is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the Division of Endocrinology at the University of California, San Francisco. He has specialized in the field of neuroendocrinology, and a lot of his work has emphasized the regulation of energy balance by the central nervous system. His research and clinical practice has focused on childhood obesity and diabetes, and he's an expert about nutrition and metabolic health, generally speaking. He's written a number of books and many scientific studies uh, that have to do with all of these areas. Uh, I believe his latest book was Metabolical, The Lure and and the lies of processed food, nutrition, and modern medicine. He's one of my favorite people to follow who's uh, very public about disseminating information about metabolic health and what is actually causing it. We talked about the causes of obesity and metabolic dysfunction. That included a discussion of obesogens. These are things that cause obesity. These can be either components of our food, like fructose, or other things that we're eating that we normally think of as food, or they can be other environmental contaminants. Lots of the stuff that is in our household goods and products can also get into our bodies and cause obesity and metabolic dysfunction. We talked about oxidative stress and mitochondrial biology. We talked about the difference between different types of sugars, like fructose versus glucose. We talked about different types of fats, like omega-6 and omega-3 polyunsaturated fats versus saturated fats. We actually broke down the saturated fats even further into even and odd-chained saturated fats and talked about whether or not those things actually cause obesity and cardiovascular vascular disease. We talked about scientific funding and the role that uh, industry plays in driving many popular perceptions of what causes obesity. We talked about all different aspects of nutrition and metabolic health. We talked about why people who live in colder or higher altitude climates are often skinnier or less obese than people who live in other places. We talked about uh, basically what the true causes of obesity and metabolic dysfunction actually are. Um, This is a really great episode. If you're interested in this topic broadly of me- metabolic health and nutrition. I highly recommend this episode. It's one of you know probably the most information dense episodes I've done on this general subject area. And as a reminder, I have all of my podcasts on my Substack at mindandmatter.substack.com. On that Substack page, you will also find my long form science writing. And that includes a series I'm writing right now about metabolic health that integrates a lot of the information in this episode together with information from other episodes. And you can sign up for my free weekly newsletter as well as be Become a paid subscriber if you're getting a lot of value from the podcast and want to help me keep going and keep growing. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen and it's a handheld pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters to get $50 off your Lumen device today. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Robert Lustig. Um, You know, I'll have an intro written up for you so we don't don't need to go over, you know, your full background and everything. Um, You're fairly well known and, um, you know, I'll describe you at the beginning uh, for people who don't know you. Uh, We're going to be talking about obesity and obesogens today and related topics. Um, I want to start at the beginning of obesity. And as I understand it, that means for you know any individual before they're even born. So what can you tell us about how the metabolic health of our parents and the in utero conditions that we live in when we're little babies before we're even born affect our propensity to develop obesity and metabolic disease? Well, that's a you know loaded question, Nick, uh, to, to, to say the least. 
Um, we've learned uh, in the last uh, 30 years about a new aspect of medicine, and it's called the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, or DOHAD. Uh, the first person to notice this was a uh, uh, epidemiologist uh, working in Southampton, England, by the name of David Barker. And he was basically going through records of people who were born uh, during the war, during World War II, and noticed that these people were dying early. And he didn't know why. And, you know, it was years later that he he noticed this. And um, he did an enormous amount of uh, uh, exculpatory work that to this day is, you know, kind of classic uh, uh, epidemiology. And he came to the realization that something was going on in utero that was actually changing these fetuses physiology that was ultimately leading to the ultimate development of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, et cetera. And um, he presented that and people started, you know, looking at this question and they found, you know, similar uh, stories elsewhere and they started doing, um, you know, uh, animal uh, experiments. And sure enough, it looked like um, what the mother was exposed to ultimately is visited upon the baby later on. Now, we had always thought that the placenta was this great um, barrier that kept the mother from the baby. And we had lots of reasons to think that because after all, you know, mom's immune system does not become the baby's immune system. And, you know, we thought that these various transporters that live in the placenta help, you know, uh, determine, you know, the stuff that needs to get in and keep the stuff out that doesn't need to get in. And there are enzymes in the placenta that keep, um, uh, for instance, cortisol from getting to the baby, uh, you know, unless, of course, the mother takes something that the enzyme can't work on, like, for instance, dexamethasone, and then it does go to the baby. So we had this notion that the placenta was all seeing and all knowing. And the ultimate, you know, suit of armor for for the baby, and that mother's diet didn't matter, and that mother's medicines didn't matter, and ultimately, when we learned about microbiome, that mother's microbiome didn't matter. And it turns out all of that is hogwash. <laughs> the placenta is not that great. <laughs> it's it lets a lot of stuff across, and it doesn't do what we think it does. And so, in fact. The fetus ends up swimming in the same cesspool of contaminants and environmental exposures that the rest of us do. And so it shouldn't be too surprising that those contaminants, when they have effects on us, that they would also have effects on the fetus. Now, one of those that I happen to be particularly interested in, so I've done a lot of work on obesity, are these chemicals which we now term obesogens. That is, they are chemicals that drive adiposity, drive weight gain, drive chronic disease in humans, both you know adults and, as it turns out, also fetuses, having nothing to do with their potential inherent calories. So there are a lot of substances that have calories but generate more adiposity than their calories like my favorite fructose and there are plenty of chemicals that generate adiposity having nothing to do with calories like for instance polyfluoral uh, alkylated substances pfas like teflon okay or bpa bisphenol a which turns out to be an estrogen um, and you know there's a whole host of uh, compounds, phthalates, plasticizers, PBDEs, flame retardants, uh, parabens, uh, things that are in cosmetics, things that are in vinyl flooring, things that are in, uh, oh, oh, and by the way, air pollution to boot, all right? And so you'd think the placenta would be a great way to keep the fetus away from all of these things because after all, fetuses don't use cosmetics and fetuses don't breathe our air. But you know what? they're still getting damaged. 
And that's what we've learned. And the obesogen hypothesis brings this question of what's really at the uh, uh, at the nidus of this obesity pandemic that is really only about 50 years old. You know, before, you know, 1970, only 5% of the population was above the 95th percentile for body mass index. You know, this has all occurred in the last 50 years and something has to explain it. And, you know, our DNA hasn't changed but our environment sure has. And, you know, people want to say, well, it's because of the food, you know, because people are gluttons and sloths. No, it turns out that there are chemicals driving this. And that's, you know, part of, you know, what my research has been about for the last uh, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So there are both food and non-food obesogens, substances that we're exposed to that promote obesity and, and promote metabolic dysfunction probably in other ways. Um, starting with some of the food obesogens, you mentioned fructose. Yeah, that's the big one. How Now, how is it an obesogen? How, how is it punching above its weight compared to, say, glucose or some other comparable food? Right, absolutely. So this is what I've spent my entire, you know, obesity career. I have two careers. You know, one was on, working on why boys are boys and girls are girls from the neck up. That was what I did for the first uh, 20 years of my career. And then for the second 20 was on obesity. Um, but uh, why is fructose a, an obesogen unrelated to its calories? Because glucose has calories and glucose stimulates insulin and insulin drives weight gain. So glucose should be just as big a problem for obesity as fructose. It turns out that the reason is because of the way it is metabolized and also what it does to the brain. So there are three reasons that fructose is worse than glucose in terms of obesity and also metabolic disease like diabetes. And those three things are, number one, fructose is not metabolized in all the organs in the body like glucose is. Fructose is metabolized in the liver. So an entire fructose bolus, like a 20 ounce Coke, you drink it, that fructose all goes to the liver. The glucose will go anywhere, but the fructose all goes to the liver. So pound for pound, you're putting more stress basically on the liver, on that one organ. Gram for gram, right. Gram for gram. <laughs> you're putting more stress on the liver because it's all going to the liver because only the liver has the GLUT5 transporter for fructose. So what does the liver do with the fructose once it's in there? Well, for glucose, what it does is it tries to uh, turn it into glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose, which is non-toxic and which basically every liver has some and, you know, marathon runners have more because they're running marathons. So they load up with pasta very specifically to drive their liver glycogen stores. And that's where you want to put extra energy because glycogen is, for lack of a better word, non-toxic. But fructose does not go to glycogen. Okay, there's no direct uh, uh, pathway from fructose to glycogen. It goes instead down to the mitochondria through the Emden-Meyerhoff or glycolytic pathway, which takes you from fructose to acetyl-CoA. And then acetyl-CoA then enters the mitochondria, and the mitochondria would then burn the acetyl-CoA through the Krebs cycle to generate carbon dioxide and water and ATP. And the whole goal of this is ATP. So um, fructose overwhelms the mitochondria because the mitochondria are fixed. They have a Vmax, a maximum velocity. They can only, it, the cycle can only turn so fast. The only way to make the cycle turn faster is to have more mitochondria. By mm. the way, that's why exercise is good. You make more make mitochondria. More mitochondria. Yeah. That's a good thing. I'm not saying exercise is bad but you know ultimately a mitochondrion is a mitochondrion and you know it's not like you can you know sort of pressure test a mitochondrion if you overwhelm a mitochondrion okay it's not going to work better or faster and so what happens is you overwhelm it it can't deal with the load it ends up sending out um a, a compound called citrate 
and the citrate leaves the mitochondria through a, a process called the citrate shuttle. And then now that citrate is in the cytosol of the cell. And now the cell has to do something with that citrate. And what it does is it takes the citrate down to acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA gets bound to another acetyl-CoA to make malonyl-CoA. And then the cell starts adding two carbon fragments onto that malonyl-CoA. And so it builds from a two carbon uh, string to a 16 carbon string, which we call palmitate. Okay, and the liver only makes palmitate. And this process is known as de novo lipogenesis, new fat making. This is how your liver turns sugar, fructose in particular, into fat, palmitate, fructose to palmitate through this de novo lipogenesis. Now, once the palmitate is made, the goal is to package it in a form that can be exported out of the liver. And so it gets uh, 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 added to a glycerol molecule to make a triacylglycerol or serum triglyceride. And then that triglyceride gets packaged with ApoB100, a lipoprotein. And now you've got this little molecule, which we call VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. That's the bad that, one. And that's a bad one. And then that gets exported out of the liver. And now that your serum triglycerides have risen because you have consumed sugar, to an excess amount of sugar, and then that VLDL can either be a substrate for adiposity because insulin will work on that VLDL to deposit it in your peripheral subcutaneous tissue, and now that grows. Or it can be potentially a, uh, a driver of cardiovascular disease if it uh, unloads in the arterial wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but some of the triglyceride will be manufactured and will never make it out. It won't be packaged. In which case, now you have a lipid droplet. Now you have fatty liver disease. When you have fatty liver disease, now your insulin signaling in your liver cell doesn't work anymore. Now you have liver insulin resistance. And that makes the pancreas have to make more insulin to make the liver do its job. And that has its own negative side effects because insulin is a mitogenic factor. It is a growth mm -hmm. factor. It causes vascular smooth muscle growth. It causes glandular growth, therefore leading to cancer. So it actually increases coronary vascular disease and it increases cancer risk. And it basically is the primary driver of chronic metabolic disease. Plus, you're putting so much extra stress on the pancreatic beta cell to make that insulin that you will ultimately burn out and now you have type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. But that's only one problem. <laughs> there are three, okay? We have, we have now described one. Now let's describe problem number two. All right. You like barbecue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. I like barbecue. <laughs> Why do we paint our ribs with barbecue sauce? To get that nice caramel color and that caramel flavoring, right? That, you know, it's so good, right? Um, why do bananas brown? Okay. The point is, this is a reaction which is known as the Maillard or the browning reaction. The browning reaction is the caramelization reaction. This is why if you take sweetened condensed milk and you put it in a pressure cooker, you will get pudding. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's a, a way to make a very cheap dessert. Um, but, it, you know, it turns a white substance into a brown substance. Well, we are all browning all the time as we speak. Okay. If I went in, if I was a cardiovascular surgeon and I opened up your sternum, okay, your, the cartilage ends of your sternum would be brown today, okay? And you're a young guy, okay? Mine are even browner, okay? They started out white, now they're brown. And the reason is because of this Maillard reaction. It's occurring all over your body. It's occurring all of the time. It is a, you know, byproduct of life. There is no life without the Maillard reaction, but the goal is to make that Maillard reaction run as slow as possible. And the reason is because every time that Maillard reaction occurs, you are taking that protein and you're making it less flexible. You're making it less functional. 
because there are these glucose or fructose molecules hanging off of it, which change its conformation. And every time that reaction occurs, you are releasing a reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. So this is all like an oxygen dependent thing. Absolutely. It's completely oxygen dependent. Okay. So bottom line is you don't want that Maillard reaction to occur fast. You can't stop it, but you want it to occur as slow as possible. Well, it turns out because of the nature of the stereochemistry of the fructose molecule, fructose engages in that Maillard reaction seven times faster than glucose, and it generates 100 times the number of reactive oxygen species. So that is the aging reaction. That is the reaction that causes wrinkles. That is the reaction that causes cataracts. That is actually the reaction that causes cardiovascular disease. So more fructose, more sugar, more cardiovascular disease, having nothing to do with insulin and having mm. nothing to do with energy just because of the stereochemistry of this molecule. Mm -hmm. So unrelated to calories. And finally, number three, Remember I said there were three. Fructose stimulates the reward center in the brain. So there's an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It is the reward center. It's where cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, shopping, gambling, social media, internet gaming, pornography, all work. Okay, they all generate a dopamine signal. So the question is, fructose does that. Does glucose? And the answer is glucose does not do that. Glu glucose activates other places in the brain mostly the basal ganglia and the cortex, but it actually does not stimulate the reward center. Only fructose stimulates the reward center. <laughs> so a little sugar means you're going to have a lot more sugar because of that reward. So this, and so it's fructose, fructose specifically that is the sort of addictive sugar among the sugars. Exactly. Fructose is addictive. And in fact, on February 15th, so just three days from today, uh, Dr. Nicole Lavina, who is a neuroscientist at Mount Sinai, uh, who actually discovered sugar addiction. I mean, she's the one who basically put it on the map. And I are going to be at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco discussing sugar addiction, both from a biochemical and from a public health standpoint. Mm -hmm. And when and when you say fructose is addictive, it's, it's not a metaphor. It's literally tapping into the same mechanisms that a drug of abuse would tap into. Exactly right. So people who say, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth, that's sugar addiction until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. So no, that so, is not euphemistic. That is hardcore biochemical. So fructose, so so tell me if this is a fair summary of what you've told us so far. Fructose is more obesogenic than glucose because the body metabolizes it differently. Right. And among other things, that tells us the body doesn't treat a calorie from over here the same way it does a calorie over there. And Thank so you. that that's why it's a problem to think about the whole weight loss thing as simply calories and calories out. Exactly right. So everyone thinks it's about calories. Now, why do we think it's about calories? Because a hundred years ago, this guy named Wilbur Atwater took a bomb calorimeter and threw some fat in it and exploded it and threw some protein in and exploded it and threw some carbohydrate in and exploded it. And he came to the cal calculation that fat burned at nine calories per gram and protein uh, burned at four calories per gram and carbohydrate burned at four calories per gram also. And so he said, well, fat obviously is more energy dense, which is true. That is, that is absolutely true. That is more energy dense. That's why there is fat because it's an uh, easier way to put more calories in storage and take up less room. Yeah. That's a good thing, I guess. All right. But from the standpoint of utilization, that has nothing to do with anything. All right. And it turns out that that fat, just because it's nine calories per gram, doesn't mean it doesn't have value or that it has, you know, too much value for, and it's the target for trying to fix obesity 
because you need certain fats and you don't need other fats. And when you basically go fat free, which we all did for 50 years, okay, we actually got sicker because we actually needed the fats. And what we did was we loaded up on the carbohydrate. Remember all the pasta bars from the 1980s, you know, as everybody tried to go fat free, okay? that was the worst thing that we could have ever done because all it, what we did was we took something that was actually good for us in our diet and substitute something that was bad for us in our diet. Another mm -hmm. example, which I love is, you know, as a pediatrician, chocolate milk, you know, they took the fat out of the milk and then the kids wouldn't drink it because it tasted like dishwater. And what they do, they added the chocolate, right? They took the fat out, which was good. And they put in instead the sugar, which was bad. Mm -hmm. And because this has nothing to do with calories. And so I, that is my mantra, kill the calorie, you know, hashtag kill the calorie. And we have shown 50 ways from Sunday, why obesity is not about calories. Mm -hmm. So you've told us about a carbohydrate, uh, obesogen. That was the, the whole fructose discussion. We talked about how fructose affects the body differently than glucose. Right. And because it's processed differently and there's, it's because of the way it's processed, it's more obesogenic. Um, are there any obesogenic fats? And what I'm thinking of here, based on what you just said and some other things that, that I've discussed on the podcast recently, there's two types of fats I would like to get your take on. So one are the, um, basically the seed oils, the omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids right. and the extent to which they're obesogenic. And right. then maybe after that, I want to ask you about, you know, we were just talking about milk and other things, saturated fat. Because we've, I've been told my whole life that saturated fat is, is the really problematic one that will drive cardiovascular disease and and other bad things. Right. So let's start with the omega sixes. Okay. And I do believe you had uh, Chris Kanabi on your show already. Yes. He's a, a, you know, major proponent of getting rid of omega sixes. And I love Chris. You know, great guy. Um, I'm not sure that omega sixes are obesogenic specifically. However, they are pro-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And when you are pro-inflammatory, you generate insulin resistance. And if you generate insulin resistance, then that is obesogenic. So in that respect, they may be obesogenic indirectly as opposed to directly mm -hmm. because they are pro-inflammatory. Now, omega-6s, you need them it's not like you can do without them. If you didn't have any omega-6s, you would be eaten by the maggots, all right? They are part of your defense system against foreign invaders. And the reason is because omega-6 fatty acids, which are in seed oils, you know, um, canola oil, uh, 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 soybean oil is famous for it, you know, et cetera. Okay. Um, they are the precursors to arachidonic acid. Mm -hmm. Arachidonic acid is the precursor to virtually all of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, thromboxane, zycosinoids, uh, 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 missing one, thromboxane. Prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, prostaglandins, right, sorry. Um, so you need them, but you don't need too many of them. Mm -hmm. And it is estimated that what we need is an omega-6 to omega-3, which is anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of about one to one would be optimal, but you can only really achieve that if you live on a coast. Mm -hmm. And, or, th you know, three to one, four to one, maybe tops. Our current omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 20 to 25 to one based on how many processed foods you eat. Mm -hmm. And when that, that little that little comment you made about living near the coast, was that... Uh, alluding to seafood? Yeah. Basically, seafood has omega-3s. And the reason is not because the seafood makes omega-3s. The seafood eats the omega-3s. The omega-3s are made by algae. Algae make omega-3s. The fish eat the algae. We eat the fish. So we get our omega-3s third hand. And they are anti-inflammatory. We're talking about three omega-3s. ALA, uh, 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 alpha uh linolenic acid, ALA, and that you can find in vegetables, but alpha linolenic acid, ALA, has been shown to have cardiovascular protection, but not neural protection. It doesn't get mm -hmm. to the brain. 
The next one is EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid. That gets to the brain and that improves neural transmission and it is absolutely essential for brain health. The problem is that EPA is the one that smells fishy. Mm. So it's not in a lot of processed foods. <laughs> and fresh, then finally, so fresh EPA smells fishy. It's not just oxidized EPA. Yeah, well, more uh, oxidized EPA will smell fishier. Got it. Without a question. I mean, there's a little bit of a smell, but not, not nearly as much. But, mm -hmm. And then finally, the last one is DHA, docohexaenoic acid. <laughs> DHA is necessary for neuronal structure. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that ALA does not really get converted to EPA or DHA. The percent conversion of that in the body is extremely low, mm -hmm. like less than 1%. So if you tried to get all of your omega-3s through a purely plant-based diet, would that be problematic for that reason? Yes. Yes. And so people who are on plant-based diets really do need to take some form of omega-3 supplementation because ALA alone is not enough. So they can take fish oil, but then they're not vegan anymore because <laughs> it came from fish. They can take algal oil and stay vegan, and that's okay, but algal oil is primarily DHA, not EPA. Mm. So it still becomes a little bit of a problem. So personally, I think the right, uh, the best uh, diet, if someone asked me what the best diet was, I would say pescatarian because you can basically have the best of both worlds mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, what, what you're eating and uh, 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 effects on the, on the environment. That would be my, my personal choice, mm -hmm. but you know, it is what it is. I still like barbecue. <laughs> um, so anyway, omega sixes are highly inflammatory because they are the precursors to these inflammatory cytokines. We need to get those down. And Chris Kanabi has basically argued, I think effectively, that those omega-6s are driving multiple different diseases as well, including, in his case, uh, um, acute macular degeneration or AMD, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, for good reason. So uh, omega-6s are an issue. Mm -hmm. and, and probably, if we just had to put, put it in one sentence, the best way to reduce omega-6 intake is probably just to reduce processed foods generally. In general, yes, absolutely, because that's where they're hiding. And then finally, you asked about saturated fat. Yeah. Now, we have been told for time immemorial that saturated fat is the bad guy. I am here to say that saturated fat is not the bad guy. Saturated fat is cardiovascularly neutral. It's neither good nor bad, but it is necessary. You need saturated fat in order to be able to make a decent membrane, decent mm -hmm. cell membrane. So so there, there's actually an analogy here, maybe with the omega-6s, which is you don't want too many omega-6s, but they are essential. Can we think a similar way with the saturated fats? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, saturated fat <clears throat> has certain advantages. Number one, because it's saturated, you can heat it to any level you want, right? And it won't cause the isomerization at the double bond to turn cis fatty acids into trans fatty acids. And trans fats are the devil incarnate. The mm -hmm. Trans fats are the single most poisonous thing you can put in your body that we call food. I see. So trans fats are, are very, very bad. And is tell me if this is a fair statement. Anytime you heat an unsaturated fat, to a high enough temperature, you're running the risk of creating some trans fat. Correct. That's exactly right. So we want unsaturated fats. We have demonstrated the benefit and value of unsaturated fats, like for instance, olive oil. Olive oil is oleic acid. Oleic acid is the endogenous ligand of a uh, transcription factor in the liver called PPAR alpha proxosome proliferation activated receptor alpha. It's one of the things that runs the liver. It's a fuel gauge on the liver cell. It's a good thing. And, you know, I'm for olive oil <laughs> and I got a lot of it upstairs. Uh, but, but olive oil has a relatively low smoking point. 
of 310 degrees Fahrenheit. So cooking with it could be a problem. So depending on how you cook, cooking with olive oil, especially if you put it in a frying pan and you heat it something up, you know, to fry something in olive oil could potentially be a problem because you could be making trans fats at home. Right. And the more double bonds that any given fat has, the more risk you run of creating trans fats at home. Mm -hmm. So, so this is why this is like deep frying in, in omega six polyunsaturated fats is so problematic. And exactly, exactly. But of course, that's what every state fair has. <laughs> so, what what are you going to do? <clears throat> so, the, so saturated fat gets away from that. Saturated fat will not isomerize because there's nothing to isomerize, and the uh, smoking point of saturated fat is much higher. So, you will not get into any trouble. Now, saturated fat got a bad rap because of all of this very bad epidemiology that was done back in the 1950s and 1960s. All right. A guy named Ansel Keys, who's sort of famous in the literature, he was a hero, even appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Okay. And now he is a villain and has been appropriately vilified. <clears throat> He was the one who basically correlated saturated fat consumption with mortality mm -hmm. uh, due to cardiovascular disease back in the 1950s. However, when you look at the data, he cherry picked it. He cherry picked it. Okay. He published a volume, a, a very long volume, about an 800 page volume called the Seven Countries Study. Jeez, I didn't know it was that big. Yeah, it's pretty big. And on to page 262 of that volume, and I know because I took it out and I made, you know, like a slide of it. <laughs> okay. He basically said that the reason that um, uh, sucrose, sugar consumption, was associated with cardiovascular disease was because of the association of sucrose with saturated fat. In other words, donuts. And all the countries that he picked in his seven countries, even though there were 22, he picked the seven that made his case. The seven that um, uh, showed the highest incidence of mortality from cardiovascular disease were all donut eaters. And the countries that were not, were not donut eaters. So it was obscuring uh, the story you told us earlier about fructose. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Those people were not just eating high saturated fat. They were also eating high sugar. And what he did was he basically dropped it out. Mm -hmm. Is it made it messy? I don't. I don't want to spend too much more time on Ansel Keys because everyone's talked <laughs> to death about him. Yeah. Is it established fairly well that he intentionally cherry picked this data? Well, intent is complicated, as we have learned in the last two years. Um, I'm not sure. I never asked him. Mm. I don't know that anyone ever asked him if he intended but there were 22 countries and when he published it there were only seven mm -hmm. we have the data on the other 15 and they don't fit so i don't know you tell me did he or didn't he got it <sighs> okay um one more question about saturated fat that i think is important um can we th we're talking about saturated fat but are there multiple types of saturated fat that we should be distinguishing and thinking about analogous to the way that we talk about omega-6s versus omega-3s? Well, in fact, that's right. So, you know, we've learned a calorie is not a calorie. And by the way, a, an amino acid is not an amino acid. And we've learned a carbohydrate is not a carbohydrate. We've even learned a fiber is not a fiber. Mm. And of course, a uh, fat is not a fat. So there are two types of saturated fats, not one, two. There's red meat saturated fats, and then there's dairy saturated fats. And they are not the same either, even though dairy comes from a animal that also provides red meat. So like, why is that? But it's true. So it turns out red meat is filled with even chain saturated fatty acids, C16 and C18, palmitate and stearate. 
And those, as I've said, are cardiovascularly neutral. Got it. Red meat, saturated fats, even chained, those are cardiovascularly neutral. Neutral, neutral. Not not, not uh, good or bad. Not good or bad. Neither good nor bad. Dairy saturated fat, so like in milk, turns out to be odd chain saturated fatty acids, C15 and C17. And those odd chain saturated fatty acids have a specific phospholipid signature on their tail end, which is why they stay in solution. Because after all, fat, you know, is in milk, right? I mean, yes, the cream rises to the top, but there's still fat in milk, even after the cream rises to the top. The, the phospholipid, you know, allows both the, you know, the, the oil and the water, if you will, to mix. <clears throat> and so um, they turn out to actually be protective against cardiovascular disease. Protective. Protective. Dairy saturated fat is protective against so, cardiovascular disease. So are you telling us that there's no saturated fats that are clearly negative across That's the board? Right. That's right. There are no saturated fats that are clearly negative. They're neutral if they're even chained neutral. like red meat, and they're actually protective if they're odd chained like from dairy. Exactly right. So you also have to know that you know the reason everybody made a bruja over saturated fats was this molecule that came out of your liver called LDL. Mm -hmm. Now we've already talked about VLDL. Well, LDL and VLDL are not the same either. Okay. What makes VLDL? Sugar. What makes LDL? Dietary fat, dietary saturated fat. Okay. So there's no question that dietary saturated fat increases your LDL. And there's also no question that in large population studies, LDL levels correlate with cardiovascular disease. That is also true. Okay, the hazard risk ratio for high LDL and coronary heart disease is 1.3. So if you have a high, LD, a high LDL, you are 30% more likely to die of a heart attack than if you don't have a high LDL. Okay, that's real. And I'm not even saying it's not. I totally subscribe to that. 1.3. Turns out the public health community has identified 1.3 as sort of what's necessary for a public health effort. So if it was 1.29, we wouldn't even be having this discussion <laughs> because it'd be, we'd be below the threshold. But we're at 1.3. That VLDL that I told you about before, the hazard risk ratio for high triglyceride and coronary heart disease is 1.8. So if you have a high triglyceride, you are 80% more likely to have a heart, die of a heart attack than if you have a low triglyceride. So which one is worse, the LDL or the triglyceride? Well, clearly the triglyceride. So why are we spending all this time worried about the LDL when we're not even focused on the triglyceride? And the answer is because we had a medicine for it. Mm. So we that's why patterns. that's why when my mother, my late middle-aged mother, recently went to the doctor and her LDL was high, but her triglycerides looked fine, the doctor was immediately like, you should be on a statin. Well, that's what the guidelines say. And the guidelines suck because they're not taking into account this whole issue. In addition, there's not one LDL. Mm -hmm. There's two. And we don't normally measure the VLDLs when you go to the doctor. Is that accurate? Number one, you don't, well, you measure serum triglyceride when you go to the doctor, but there are two LDLs. Mm -hmm. So VLDL is its own thing, but there are two LDLs. There's one called large buoyant or type A, and there's another one called small denser type B. Mm. And it's been shown that the large buoyant is the one that dietary fat raises, but the large buoyant, and that, and by the way, large buoyant is 80% of your LDL concentration in your blood. But it turns out the large buoyant are cardiovascularly neutral. That's why I said, you know, for the most part, they're cardiovascularly neutral because the large buoyant LDL do not contribute. Number one, they're large. They're so large, they don't fit under the surface of the endothelial cell to start the foam cell formation process to actually drive the plaque. And 
they're buoyant they float so they take they go through laminar flow in your arteries and arterioles and they basically don't set up a chance for those um uh, particles to be able to actually get under the endothelium to cause problems so large buoyant are cardiovascularly neutral because they're not contributing to the pathogenetic process of heart disease conversely small dense they're small okay they're you know i mean from an angstrom standpoint they're about uh 10 angstroms smaller than the large buoyant um you know 273 versus 283 microns or so uh, or ang angstroms sorry angstroms and they are small enough to get under the surface of the endothelial cell and they're dense they don't float so they fall out of laminar flow so that they can approach the um uh, endothelial cell surface so they can get underneath and then they oxidize and now you've got oxidized small dense ldl and now you've got a pathogenetic substrate for heart disease no ifs ands or buts mm -hmm. so the bottom line is a fat's not a fat an ldl is not an ldl okay and uh you know this whole concept that we should go fat free to solve the problem actually only created two more it created both obesity and mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes yeah it created those problems and it did not solve the one that we thought it would right <clears throat> so you know we need to rethink how we did this and where we came from and basically you know when you when you make a mistake you admit the mistake and you write the ship you know we have not admitted the mistake and we have not righted the ship mm -hmm. and so that's what i spend all of my time basically trying to you know get the medical community to you know you know sort of get get with the get with the program mm -hmm. so given what you told us about statins and ldl and all that in your opinion what are the what what characteristics does someone have that justify a statin prescription so statins stop you from making your own ldl okay that that is true and by the way full disclosure i have been on a statin for 33 years mm. okay i i went on my actually i take back sorry 31 years 31 years i've been on a statin since 1993 and the reason is because everyone in my family has heart disease my grandfather died at age 44 of a heart attack my father had his first heart attack at age 61. okay everyone in my family has rampant heart disease my sister when uh 40 years ago um uh, when i worked at rockefeller she was a research subject in jan breslow's lab and my colleague uh, and good friend elliot britton did a heparin test on her to demonstrate that she had familial hypercholesterolemia so mm. I, I'm a heterozygote. Oh, really? Yeah. So okay. I know. I already know. You have a specific I, genetic reason for this. I have a specific genetic reason. So I have been on a statin for 31 years, and I've also tried myself off the statin more recently, and my LDL, you mm. know, popped up from 70 to 300 again. And how common is this condition? How common are people one in, like you? One in 500. 500. Okay. Okay. So I'm not against statins. They probably, you know, the reason I'm still st sitting here talking to you. Okay. For the right patient. And if you have familial hypercholesterolemia, either homozygote or heterozygote, you need them. Okay. So I'm glad they're here. I'm not, I'm not anti statin. I want to make that very clear. However, having said that, of the people who are on statins today which is a whole lot of people turns out probably four out of every four out of five people who are on them don't need them they were put on them for what we call primary prevention that is they went to the doctor they got their labs drawn doctor said oh your ldl is a little high let's put you on a statin and the reason is because the guidelines say so so if you don't put somebody on a statin, you're not following the guidelines. And the guidelines are based on this hazard risk ratio of 1.3. So the question is, for primary prevention, do statins work? 
We've been using statins for over 40 years now. For primary prevention, do statins work? And the answer is many meta-analyses have been done and they all show that for primary prevention, that is not having had a heart attack yet, just having a high LDL, no event, the mean increase in lifespan for being on a statin is four days. Four days. Now, when you think about the fact that 20% of people who go on statins end up with some level of rhabdomyolysis, you know, the muscle breaks down, they end up with severe inflammation, and 20% have high blood glucose, they have hyperglycemia, because statins interfere with mitochondrial function, that's why they work, to get your cholesterol down. Okay. Um, you know, that's not a good thing. So you were putting people at risk for four days of increased longevity and, you know, incurring this huge side effect profile. So let's, let's just uh, restate this uh, explicitly. This, you're, when you say you're putting people at risk with a statin, at risk for what, what's the, the for list rhabdomyolysis of and uh, hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia and, and muscle loss, basically. Yes. So, you know, bottom line, if you have set, if you've already had a heart attack, if you've already declared yourself, okay, or if you have familial hypercholesterolemia like I do, then you absolutely need a statin. And then the data on statin use and longevity is very, very strong and very robust. So for secondary prevention, totally, absolutely sign up. You need it. And if you're, if it's primary prevention and you don't have FH, um, I think this is a, you know, real travesty. And if you have type, let's say you have type two diabetes, no personal history of heart attacks and no, no family history that's, uh, abnormal. It's average family history with respect to cardiovascular disease. What would, what would your general position be on if statins are a good idea for a diabetic? No. So if you have type two diabetes, the first thing to do is get rid of the type two diabetes. Everyone assumes that type 2 diabetes is this chronic, unrelenting, progressive, destructive, degenerative process that will never get better. And, you know, you're going to be on medicine, whether it's insulin or oral hypoglycemics, you know, for the rest of your life. That's the general gestalt amongst the uh, cognoscente in, uh, in medicine. Garbage absolutely not true absolutely not true numerous studies now show that a ketogenic diet can actually reverse type 2 diabetes verta health 77 percent of people who go on a ketogenic diet reverse not ameliorate reverse their type 2 diabetes just by getting rid of the offending agent. And what is the offending agent? Well, what is type 2 diabetes? It is extreme carbohydrate intolerance. So if you're intolerant to something, what's the best way to deal with it? Get it out of your diet. That's how you deal with an intolerance. If you are lactose intolerant, get the lactose out of your diet. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have, you know, if you have peanut allergy, get the peanuts out of your diet. Whatever it is that you have an intolerance to, you know, get it out of your diet. So, but yeah, but so get uh, carbohydrate out of your diet, you are on a ketogenic diet. And it turns out a ketogenic diet will reverse, reverse type two diabetes. Now, there are other ways to do it too. It's not like you have to be on a ketogenic diet, but that is one way. And what it does is it is the, you know, the, 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 the test case. It is the, it is the, you know, theory of the, of the argument. Okay. That if you fix the diet, you can fix your type two diabetes. So, you know, I have family members who are type two diabetic. Um, they're on statins. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not, they're not given clear dietary guidelines by their physician, except to cut out basically junk food, which, which by that, they mean like candy and things like that. But they're told, for example, eat as much fruit as you want. Does that make sense to you? 
Fruit's complicated, but let me let me try to explain fruit. Okay, so yes, get rid of candy, but there's a whole bunch of other things you have to get rid of too in order to you know make that right. I guess the you know the question is okay, get rid of candy, sure, sure. Is Cheetos food? Is Cheetos food? Yes or no? Probably well, not. It's got calories. It's got calories. Is Cheetos food? So what is the definition of food? That's that's what we need to know. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. So go to the dictionary. I've got one up here if you want. I'll read it to you. Okay. I've learned I've memorized it. <laughs> the definition of food is substrate that contributes to either the growth or burning of an organism. That is food. Growth or burning. So the question is. Does ultra processed food contribute to growth? My colleague, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, has now looked at this and has shown actually that ultra processed food inhibits growth. It inhibits skeletal bone growth, it inhibits trabecular bone growth, it inhibits long bone growth, it actually reduces uh, calcium uh, uh, in, in cortical bone. Okay. It changes epiphyseal function. Okay, so it is inhibiting growth. And we also know it hijacks growth for cancer, you know, because it basically um, fructose in particular does not need to be burned in the mitochondria, right? I see. So it sounds like you're saying there's an inhibition of natural or good growth, and there's actually, uh, it's actually stimulating pathological forms of growth. Correct. Correct. And how about burning? So mitochondria burn, right? Fructose which is in all virtually all ultra processed food. I mean, you know, it's been added to 73% of the items in the American grocery store on purpose. Okay. It inhibits three separate enzymes necessary for mitochondria to do their job. It inhibits AMP kinase, which is the uh, enzyme that drives mitochondrial biogenesis. So you get make more mitochondria and fresher mitochondria. It inhibits ACADL, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain, which is necessary to cleave the two carbon fragments to engage in beta oxidation in the mitochondria so that you can burn in the first place. And finally, it inhibits CPT1A, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1A, which is the enzyme which regenerates carnitine. And carnitine is the shuttle mechanism by which the fatty acids get from outside the mitochondria to inside the mitochondria. So basically, you can't even import the fatty acids to burn. So ultra processed food does not contribute to growth and does not contribute to burning. So is ultra processed food food? Is Cheetos food? What do you well, think? I knew what I was asking when I asked it. Yeah. Bottom line is we think it's food because it has calories can you name something else that has calories that's not food alcohol alcohol yeah alcohol alcohol is not food there's no dietitian on the planet who will say that alcohol is food but alcohol's got calories it's got seven calories per gram how about trans fats trans fats are nine calories per gram a trans fats food trans fats used to be food and in 2013 the fda said no actually they're poison so just because something has calories doesn't make it food. And that's the key. That's that's what we have to impress upon the population. And that's a different message than they have been getting for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I originally wanted to ask you about obesogens. And in my mind, I had food and non-food obesogens. But it sounds yeah. like the way you would frame it is, Actually, none of them are foods, really. We, there's just some that we normally think of as foods and then the ones that we already don't think of as foods. That's right. Exactly. So these are all, you would just call all of these obesogens or contaminants or, or even poisons. Absolutely. They happen to be in our food, but that doesn't make them food. That's exactly right. So, so then now let's go back to the question you asked me at the beginning that started this diatribe. <laughs> fruit. What about fruit? Because fruit has fruit sugar, fruit has fructose. So is it not food? And the answer is fruit is okay 
And the reason it's okay is because not only does it have the poison, but it also has the antidote. Which is the fiber. The antidote is the fiber. No, I, I fully recognize this and, and I accept the argument here. I think it makes sense for a, a, a healthy person. But let's say you've, you've, you're talking about someone with type 2 diabetes whose goal should be to reverse that. Right. Um, uh, my inclination would be to say, well, why don't you just cut out all of the fruit? So yes, the fiber will prevent you from absorbing it as quickly, but wouldn't a better strategy be to just cut it out completely until you reverse the diabetes? I agree with that. Now, if you have diabetes, if you have type 2 diabetes, almost assuredly, you also have fatty liver disease. Okay, it, the correlation between fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes is extremely tight. Okay, it's almost for sure that the reason for your diabetes is because your liver is not working right. And because your liver is not working right, your pancreas had to make extra insulin to make your liver work right. And now your pancreas is burned out. And so you got to give your pancreas a chance to regenerate and, you know, and, and work properly. And the only way to do that is to make your liver work properly. So you got to burn off that liver fat. You got to get rid of that liver fat in order to fix the problem. And ketogenic diet will do that. And the reason is because the LDLs that the liver makes out of your dietary fat don't get clogged. Only the VLDL that comes from sugar gets clogged. The LDLs get exported right out. The VLDLs sometimes don't. So if you're clearing LDL and you're not making VLDL, your liver has a chance to be able to heal itself. And so that to me is where it starts. So if you have type 2 diabetes and you have fatty liver disease, which if you don't know it, I'm telling you, odds are you do. Best thing to do is give your liver a rest. And the best way to give your liver a rest is don't challenge it. And fructose is a primary challenge. And so if you're asking me, if you have type 2 diabetes already, best not to eat fruit until the diabetes is resolved. And then you can probably add it back in reasonable amounts. What are some other, um, so <laughs> the caveat of, of everything we just talked about with uh, the definition of food, I want to talk about non-food obesogens. You mentioned some earlier. What are one, two big examples, things that are all over the place that people are using commonly? And what do we know about the, the mechanisms here? Well, there are a lot. There are a lot of obesogens. There are a lot of mechanisms. Bottom line is um, they're, all, they're all around us. And to, for the most part, we put them there. All right? they're, they're all, for the most part, part of our uh, Anthropocene. They're part of you know, the man-made environment that we have uh, created for ourselves. Um, they can act through multiple different pathways there are multiple receptors in the body that can transduce these obesogen signals, but they're all basically receptor mediated signals. So it can be the estrogen receptor. It can be the androgen receptor. It can be the glucocorticoid receptor. It can be the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. It can be LA, LXR or FXR in the, uh, in the liver. Okay, it can be the PPR gamma receptor. Uh, there are a bunch of different uh, compounds and there are a bunch of different receptors. All of those receptors that I just listed off are part of the evolutionary process of a fat cell. They will create adipose. Oh, I've got thyroid hormone receptor. That's in there too. Um, they will create adiposity when stimulated. And so different obesogens will stimulate different receptors. So the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, grilling your food will activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So remember I said I love barbecue? Well, you want to get rid of that? You might have to get rid of the barbecue. Well, that's a problem. What, um, what is it about the barbecue? Is it, is it the like the chard? The chard. Yeah. The chard part. Yes. So I don't know how to make barbecue without charring, 
<laughs> it's part of the part of the process unfortunately that's one of the reasons why everybody says eat raw too and you know number one the fiber is still there and you haven't created any of these dietary advanced glycation end products that's another thing that you know it drives this phenomenon so um the glycation that we talked about before the Maillard reaction it can occur in the body or can occur in the um in the can before you even eat it if it occurs in the body it generates the reactive oxygen species directly if it occurs in the can before you eat it then what happens is that dietary advanced glycation end product will bind to a receptor for advanced glycation end products on your cells called rage r-a-g-e receptor for advanced glycation end products and activate the nadph oxidase generating reactive oxygen species also so it's you know they're they're everywhere including in the canned or you know uh, packaged foods to start with that you know if they if the food's been heated before you got it there's a good chance there are dietary ages in the food before you even put it in your mouth um air pollution as i mentioned is an inflammatory reactant which has been shown to increase adiposity um and that has nothing to do with calories I mean, it has to do with the air right pm 2.5 particulate matter at 2.5 microns or smaller so that it gets into your bloodstream and dr drives an inflammatory response bpa bisphenol a which activates the estrogen receptor because it needs just need uh, the estrogen receptor just needs two hydroxyl groups 22 angstroms apart and you're an estrogen so you know there are a lot of estrogens are in, are in, an, in our environment and bpa is everywhere if you've ever opened up a can and there's a whitish lining to it that's bpa so it just it just happens to be that the estrogen receptor has a structure that is sensitive to things uh that many uh components of modernity are made out of yes exactly exactly um you know years ago many 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 years ago um i was taking care of a kid uh in wisconsin a five-year-old girl with breast development so everybody thought she had precocious puberty and we looked at her we assessed her we did every exam you know every lab test you know under the sun and everything came back negative and then i sent her urine for a tox screen thinking maybe she was getting into mom's birth control pills but mom mm -hmm. swore she didn't have any birth control pills so where would she be getting them from but i sent the urine for the tox screen anyway and what came back was genistein what is genistein genistein is a plant estrogen it's plant estrogen and that was what was driving her breast development where so, does that come from so i asked the mom i said I, I you've already told me about her diet um what do you bathe her in and she actually she looked at it she was uh, on the phone at home and she said well i use this victoria's secret bath gel and i said what are the ingredients and then she looked at it she says not for use in children <laughs> and the reason is because the reason it's victoria's secret bath gel is because it's loaded with plant estrogens to make your skin silky smooth so this kid was absorbing the estrogen through her skin from her bath got her it mo her mom was inadvertently giving her a sex hormone therapy yeah, yeah without knowing it so environmental estrogen okay can also be an environmental obesogen because after all estrogen lays down subcutaneous fat mm. as an example all right parabens uh, things that are in um cosmetics like lipstick okay and hair care products um you know it, the list it, it, uh, yeah it's it's basically yeah tributyl tin i'm tributyl not gonna tin. say everything but lot, lots and lots of things tributyl tin is what they use to paint the bottoms of boats to keep the barnacles from attaching to the hull okay so all our water supply is filled with tributyl tin and my colleague dr bruce blumberg at university of california irvine has shown that this particular compound is so egregious and also has epigenetic effects 
going forward. So you can expose an animal to tributyl tin and their great, great, great grandchild will be obese because of what you did to the great, great grand grandmother. If we're using it on boats, is, is it in the tap water? Yeah, it's in the tap water. It, and, and we're in the tap water at you know levels that are that should matter. concern us. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you know you're never going to get away from these PFAS. You know polyfluorinated mm -hmm. alkylated substances. You know the whole Teflon thing. If anybody wants to watch the movie Dark Waters, came out in 2019 with Mark Ruffalo. It's all about um, Dupont and how they hid the Teflon story from you know the the uh, from the populace for 20 years. Okay, uh, the, you know, this is, this is, and, and these are forever chemicals. They are not going away. Another example, DDT. So DDT is a plant, uh, sorry, is, is an insect estrogen. Okay, it is an insecticide. Okay, it's what we sprayed on all of the uh, crops during World War II, you know, to basically get rid of the, uh, you know, insects, malaria, and what have you. Okay, but turns out DDT is a an estrogen you know two hydroxyl groups 22 estrogens apart that's why it was a good insecticide you know it was basically a contraceptive you know for the insects but we can measure dde levels in in pregnant women's urine today and it predicts obesity in the child at age five okay it's been gone for 50 years but we can still measure it so you know, I mean, given everything that you're you're telling us, um, it's it, you know, the question is simply going to be, you know, how how does an ordinary person react to learning all of these things? And you know, I can think of a, a number of reactions, but none of them seems particularly palatable. Um, you know, reaction Indeed. one could just be you become Ted Kaczynski and you you move to a shack in Montana and try to destroy civilization. Let's assume <laughs> we don't want to go down that path. You know, reaction two could just be to say, "Fuck it." Like whatever, I don't care. I'm just gonna. That's this a, is what we live in, and that's, that's a, basically that's a what lot people of it. do. Yep. Uh, you know, reaction three could be to just become completely neurotic about all this stuff, and you know, become you know an, an, an uber health nut, for lack of a better term. Um, but most people probably aren't willing to do that. Don't want to have the anxiety and the stress that come with that as well. Is there another path? What is the path? Yeah. So, uh, Nick, you're absolutely right, and you've identified three of the four paths. There's a fourth. Okay, so you're no question. We've got people who you know are lunatics in part because of you know what society has wrought upon them. We have the people who have basically chosen to ignore it because it's just too hard. That's a lot. Most of the population, I would say, uh, we have orthorectics you know, who basically now, you know, question every single thing they put in their mouth and, you know, are um, dysfunctional because of it. It basically feeds into OCD, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to uh, uh, you know, make them very miserable. Or there's a fourth, which is actually do something about it. Okay. Number one, vote. You know, this is a voting issue. This whole obesity thing, the whole food thing, the whole environment thing is a voting issue. Now, a lot of people think that there are other reasons to vote, <laughs> but this is one of them. And you, you know, you should, you should actually, you know, want to do something about this. Another is explain this to your doctor because your doctor doesn't understand any of this and they need to. And the reason is because doctors went to medical school to learn two things, the two Ps, prescriptions and procedures. And I know because I'm one and I, that's what I learned. There's a third P, prevention. Does doctors learn prevention? Not currently. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because 80% of the medical school uh, uh, costs are underwritten by big pharma. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm trying to put, I'm going to put this in a way that isn't going to seem like defeatist. Um, so let, let's take those in reverse order. So I like the idea of talking to your doctor about these things. Um, but how do, how does, how does an ordinary person talk to their doctor about these things in a way that doesn't make their doctor just roll their eyes and say, you know, who, who are you to lecture me? I went to well, medical school. Okay. So yes, but no, I mean, it's true. 
Okay. Some doctors are very uh, provincial and some doctors are very um, uh, paternal. And I know a lot of them. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of them live in the ivory tower, you know, where I used to practice as well. So I know what you're, I know what I, I know from whence that question comes. And I, and I, and I, you know, identify with it to, to a great extent. Having said that, no doctor actually wants to do harm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to basically show them how, what they're doing is doing harm. The easiest way to do that is to show up at your doctor's office, 50 pounds lighter. Mm. having not taken their advice. And then when the doctor says, what, well, what'd you do? And then the patient says, well, I actually got the carbohydrate out of my diet. I actually changed what I had in my uh, pantry. And, you know, this is where we are. And then the doctor says, really? That's what happened? So they need to see the results. They, you know, you can't you can't explain this to them. You have to show it to them. Let me give you another example. Okay, uh, I am working right now with a uh, food company. Okay, I take no money from them, but a f food company offshore, in the Middle East. This company is the Nestle of the Middle East. Okay, they make all sorts of problem foods. They make flavored milks, frozen yogurt, ice cream, confectionery, tomato sauce, biscuits, okay? Like all ultra processed food to the highest degree, all bad stuff. And their CEO at age 48 weighed 350 pounds and had type two diabetes and back pain. And he went to his UK physicians and they put him on insulin and oral hypoglycemics and he got worse. And he said, this is not working. And so what did he do? He went to Dr. Google and he started researching it for himself. And he found two people online. He found Jason Fung, who is a nephrologist in Toronto, who is a great believer in intermittent fasting. And has written several books, The Obesity Code, The Diabetes Code. The, the, if it's a code, you know, the cancer code, if it's a code, it's his. Okay, that's his code. Uh, and me. And so... CEO started doing what we said to do. And lo and behold, in nine months, he dropped 100 pounds. His type 2 diabetes resolved. His back pain disappeared, and he thinks we hung the moon. Okay, great. And then he has his aha moment, his moment of epiphany, where he said, wait a second. If I did this to myself, eat my own crap, what am I doing to the rest of the Middle East? And so they came to me four years ago this company. And they said, we want to move into the 21st century. We want to be a metabolically healthy company. We want to change the food to contribute to the health of our population, not hurt it. Wow. How cool is that? And we've been doing that. And we actually published a paper last year in March of 2023 in Frontiers in Nutrition called The Metabolic Matrix, Re-Engineering Ultra-Processed Food to Protect the Liver, Feed the Gut, and Support the Brain. And it turns out any food, if it does all three of those things, protects the liver, feeds the gut, supports the brain, is healthy. Any food that does none of the three is poison. And any food that does one or two but not all three, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. And so you can actually set precepts and you can set protocols for being able to actually determine what needs to be done and what needs to be in ultra processed food to actually make them healthy. Now, can people do that at home? And the answer is absolutely yes, they can. Okay, well, they need some education. They need to tools to be able to help them do that. And we have developed one just for them. Okay. And your, for your uh, audience, it's called Perfect, P-E-R-F-A-C-T. It is a recommendation engine. It is not AI, very specifically not AI, because in nutrition, you know, the AI only knows what the internet knows. And in, with, when it comes to nutrition, the internet is replete with garbage, with just trash. And so you don't want AI to be making your decisions for you, 
but you want a scientist who actually knows something about metabolic health to be making your decisions for you. So go to http colon slash slash perfect with an A dot co, P-E-R-F-A-C-T dot co, and you will find a recommendation engine. And what you do is you click on it and it will show you all of the items at Walmart, Amazon, and Target, all the food items. And you can apply different filters, like for instance, no added sugar filter or a keto filter or a peanut allergy filter or a um, uh, uh, oxalate filter or, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, oh, no, no ultra processed food filter. And so it will only show you that which you can buy to make yourself metabolically healthy mm -hmm. so that the store becomes a store instead of an obstacle course. Mm -hmm. There's a way right there. Yep. So we, we talked about like these four different reactions um, that, that people can have to the whole situ the obesogenic situation that we are embedded in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of them, the second one that we talked about was the, you know, the one that just says, fuck it. Like, this is what we have. And that's probably where most people are. And I, I want to ask you about how difficult it's actually going to be to get people out of that, given um, the unholy alliance between different factions in our society. Yeah. So you've got big pharma who now has things like GLP-1 drugs at their disposal, which, you know, are, you know, get get skinny for free cards um that's basically <laughs> what, what they're being treated as um, you. you know you've got the big food big ag side which is um which makes the voting uh the voting thing difficult because everyone we vote for is completely plugged into all of these special interests mm -hmm. and then you've got i think you know both sides of that equation there um promoting things like um the so-called body positivity movement you know, mm -hmm. saying, hey, it's, hey, this is the way we are, and you should love yourself the way you are, and therefore you can just keep consuming all of these things. Yeah. Help how, how, how do we break the, uh, the sort of alliance of forces there that is, seems quite strong? Right. It, Nick, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. There are many stakeholders in this, and they all have their own angle. Agreed. And, you know, you can't fix those until you give them a better answer okay it's like the arab israeli conflict you know too many stakeholders too difficult to come up with a single answer that fact you know that helps everybody but you know what there actually is a way there is a way to do this and it it, it requires everyone coming to the table at once and that's what I'm trying to do. That's actually, you know, part of why I do what I do is um, trying to bring uh, the doctors and the nutritionists, the dietitians, and public health and the food industry and politicians, you know, and, and, and the public, you know, to the table all at the same time. But you have to be working off the same set of facts. And as you've learned, as we've learned, you know, people have their own facts, <laughs> whether they're right or not is a different story. And that's one of the reasons why I'm happy to do this podcast with you now is to try to deliver, you know, the, shall we say the truth? And somebody will say, no, that's Lustig's truth. But, you know, I can document everything I say. So um, nonetheless, um, how do you do this? Here's how I think about this problem. And I, you know, am welcome to, you know, suggestions. In the last 30 years, we have had four, count them, four cultural tectonic shifts in America. Okay. And here they are. Number one, bicycle helmets and seatbelts. Mm. Number two, smoking in public places. Number three, drunk driving. Number four condoms and bathrooms now 30 years ago if a legislator stood up in a state house or in congress or in parliament or the duma or anywhere else in the world and proposed any legislation for any one of those four they'd have gotten left right out of town nanny state liberty interest get out of my kitchen get out of my bathroom get out of my car okay None of those are problems today. 
we have solved every one of those four. Okay, you don't hear anybody belly aching about those. Oh, you hear about other belly aching. I mean, vaccines, perfect example of, you know, how, you know, new things have come into this, quote, nanny state uh, issue. Okay, but the bottom line is those four are solved. Now, how did we solve them? We taught the children. The children grew up and they voted. Remember voting? And the naysayers are dead. That's why this is a generational shift. That's, but that's also why it takes 30 years. Now, the good news about this is we're about 10 years in. Mm -hmm. All this started around 2013. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's going, it's, we already see signs of it working. We already see, you know, documentation of the public being educated. And I can actually prove that the public is being educated. The food industry actually generated the data for me. Okay. There's a public relations arm of the food industry called IFIC, I-F-I-C, the Inter International Food Information Council. Okay. It is just a PR arm of the food industry, but they publish a report every year. And every year they ask the public a question. And in 2011, they asked the public the following question. What food stuff is most likely to cause weight gain? And in 2011, 11% of the population said refined carbohydrate and sugar. And 42% said a calorie is a calorie, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. They asked the exact same question seven years later in 2018. The exact same way, no change. And now 33% of the public said refined carbohydrate and sugar. And the exact same number reduced from a calorie is a calorie, or I don't know. In other words, we taught those people the real story. So you can do it, but it's a generational shift because there are a lot of people who will never get it. And I've given up on trying to get those people to get it. I got to get the people who are receptive to be able to get it because they'll live longer because they did the right thing. And then we'll actually see the change. Uh, I have no uh, qualms about the fact that this problem is going to outlive me. You mm -hmm. know, I'm just a cog in this wheel. This is going to go way past my lifetime. Right. But the fact of the matter is you got to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the piece about this I, that I think uh, I like the best is um, whether we like it or not, um, these things are generational. They do take generational periods of time to change. And that means uh, no matter what your position is, uh, an effective strategy probably has to involve uh, educating the young. That's right. And that's what we're trying to do. I, I am the uh, chief science officer and co-founder of a nonprofit here in the Bay Area called Eat Real. So you can find that on at eatreal.org. And our function is to get real food into K to 12 around the country. Okay. All these public schools right now, they don't even have food preparation facilities. They were taken out back in the late seventies, early eighties. They were taken out because the food industry started supplying, you know, all of these schools with ultra processed food, calling it quote nutritious unquote. And I put that in air quotes for very specific reasons. Okay. Cause it wasn't nutritious. It was calories, but it wasn't nutritious because it wasn't food. Right? And that's when the grades started going down. And that's when the obesity start, you know, pandemic started, you know, rearing its ugly head. And, you know, it's only gotten worse. And if you go to any standard school in America today, it's a disaster. So I have a question for you. I have a quiz for you. Nick, what is the largest fast food franchise in America? I mean, my guess would be McDonald's. Our nation's public schools. Oh. If you add up McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and Subway, that is only half of our nation's public schools. Jesus. Okay. And every school in America uses ultra processed food to feed their kids. And the reason is because they don't have any place to make food. 
because mm. all of the food preparation facilities and all the blue hairs, you know, with the hairnets and stuff, you know, that they used to make the food, they're all fired and gone. So the question is, how can you get real food into schools today when there's no infrastructure to support it? Well, that's our genius. That's what Eat Real does. So we have multiple different paradigms we have multiple different ways to do it depending on the district depending on the uh, infrastructure that's there depending on the geographics depending on the food procurement availability so there's not one way to do it but let me give you our first way the way we started we worked with the mount diablo unified school district right across the bay in uh, patra costa county over in uh, you know east of san francisco and they had an enterprising food services director and what we did was we helped him purchase a dilapidated factory, which he then repurposed into a food preparation facility, hired all the people to work at that facility. They would cr create 27,000 meals per day. And because they were making so much food, <clears throat> and they were able to buy at scale and they were able to buy local and they knew what was in the food. So they were able to keep all the bad stuff out of the food. And then they would use trucks to basically ship it to all of the different schools each day. And so we got every kid, not just a hot meal, but a truly nutritious meal, a metabolically healthy meal. We lost 100,000 pounds of sugar out of the kids' diets in one year. And guess what? Their grades got better. Mm -hmm. And the kids ate the food. And, you know, we're, we're not going to have time to they get into it. Yeah, we're not going to have time to get into this, but do you think that the, the grades getting better part? Do you think that's basically because um, a better diet is literally going to help your brain function better? Yeah, better mitochondrial function. Absolutely. Duh. This ain't rocket science. I want to uh, shift gears a little bit, um, and I want to ask—I want to ask you about something that is very striking. Other people have pointed this out. Um, I mostly don't hear good answers to this, um, and I think it—it it might sort of tie back to things that we talked about earlier, but didn't necessarily ex explicitly put together. So, before I ask the question, um, you know, this paper on obesogens you put out recently—it basically goes through the four main models of obesity that um, scientists and and the thinkers on this uh, stuff have used to explain obesity in the past. Right. And you basically come to the conclusion, if I read you right, that we need uh, that the model that you like is an integration of the obesogens model and the oxidation reduction model. So contaminants and stuff causing oxidative stress in the body. Right. So this paper that you're referring to, which is in the International Journal of Obesity, January of 2024, first author for those who want to look it up is Heindel, Jerry Heindel. So this is a, con a conglomeration of four uh, authors, uh, Jerry Heindel, who used to run the endocrine disruptors section of the Inve National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Myself, I'm the second author, Sarah Howard, who runs HEADS, Healthy e uh, Eating and Endocrine Disruptors. And finally, Barbara Corky, who is the Banting Professor, uh, a Banting Award winner, sorry, at, the, uh, at Boston University School of Medicine. Um, who's done more on hyperinsulinemia than anybody else. And we published this paper called Obesogens, a Unifying Hypothesis on the Pathogenesis of Obesity. That sounds a little too, shall we say, you know, uh, uh, full of ourselves, but nonetheless, we think we've gotten there. So the standard model that everyone believes, which I hope I've already debunked, just from doing this podcast is the calories in calories out model or the energy balance model. Mm -hmm. If you eat more than you burn, you'll gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you'll lose weight. Yeah. And I should just emphasize for people, even like I, I did my PhD in neurobiology in the department of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at Harvard medical school. And even people studying the neurobiology of people with fancy degrees, doing fancy experiments, we would often just default to the energy balance model without even thinking about it. Absolutely. And I know that. And I and I, I cannot tell you how many arguments that I have had over my career with really smart scientists 
who basically just say, yeah, but a calorie is a calorie. Yeah, but it's it's calories in, calories out. Okay. I, I can document who in my career have basically, you know, thwarted this, you know, notion that there might be something else going on. So this is this is well, you know, ensconced, you know, it's calcified in the minds of most of the uh, intelligentsia. And the fact that it occurred in the Division of Endocrinology at Harvard Medical School is no surprise. And, you know, I won't call out your 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 bosses, but I know who they are. <laughs> anyway, bottom line. If the energy balance model is right, then how do you explain obesogens? If the energy balance model is right, then how do you explain obese newborns? If the energy balance model is right, how come body temperature has gone down 1.5 degrees centigrade over the last 150 years? If the energy balance model is right, why are uh, animals in captivity gaining weight over the last 25 years? All of those say that the energy balance model is bullshit. Plain and simple. Now, there is no question that calories play a role. But just because calories play a role does not mean the energy balance model is correct. And I will give you four reasons right now that the energy balance model is bullshit. Okay? Let's start with fiber. You like almonds? Yeah, I love almonds. Now, almonds are great, okay? Except for they take a lot of water, okay? But you eat 160 calories in almonds. How many of those calories do you absorb? 130. You ate 160, you absorbed 130. Where'd the other 30 go? The fiber in the almonds, the soluble and insoluble fiber, formed a gel on the inside of the intestine, an impenetrable secondary barrier. So the insoluble fiber acted like a fishnet and the soluble fiber plugged the holes in the fishnet. And you can actually see the whitish gel on the inside of the intestinal lumen on electron microscopy. And so what's happening is that it's preventing those 30 calories from being absorbed early. And so they go down the intestine where the microbiome is, and then they get chewed up by the microbiome for its own purposes. So even though you consumed it, even though it passed your lips, you actually didn't get it because your microbiome did. You know, we always, you know, we always tell pregnant women, you're eating for two. Well, we're always eating for a hundred trillion because we have to feed our microbiome. You know, they end up consuming 25 to 30% of all the calories that we eat. Well, if they consume 25%, but if you can change the microbiome so that they consume 30% of what we eat, you've just gotten thin. Just by changing the microbiome from 25% to 30% without changing anything that passed your lips. So this calories in thing, it's just bullshit from the beginning. Has been forever. Number two, protein. So if you are using a, an amino acid to build muscle or build anything in the body, then the amino acid goes straight there. Okay, fine. If you're using the amino acid to turn into energy, you have to take the amino group off, okay? Because you can't burn an amino acid. You can burn an organic acid, but you can't burn an amino acid. So you have to deamidate the amino acid. You have to take the amino, the NH2 group off the amino acid, right? That ends up costing more energy than, say, phosphorylating a carbohydrate, getting it ready for absorption. So there's a net loss in burning protein for energy than there is in burning carbohydrate for energy, even though they're both four calories per gram. So a uh, calorie is not a calorie because if you're burning an amino acid versus burning a carbohydrate, you're losing energy. There's a net loss. So calorie is not a calorie. Number three, fatty acids. We've already talked about this. We have 
you know, omega threes over here, heart healthy, save your life, anti Alzheimer's, anti inflammatory, best thing you can put in your body. And over here, we have trans fats, you know, devil incarnate, you know, consumable poison will kill you. They're both nine calories per gram. One will save your life, one will kill you because the calorie is not a calorie. And finally, fructose and glucose. And we've already done that one. Okay. Fructose makes adiposity because of the three things it does, the de novo lipogenesis, the Maillard reaction, and the activation of the reward center. Glucose doesn't, but they're both four calories per gram. So calories in, calories out never made sense. In addition, I did work that basically showed this to me back in the 90s. I took care of these kids at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, that became massively obese after their brain tumor. So this is a form of obesity called hypothalamic obesity because your hypothalamus is damaged. And these kids gained weight like crazy. As soon as the tumor was diagnosed and treated, they started gaining weight at a kilo a month nonstop ad infinitum. Okay? Now, George Bray, the father of obesity research in America, at UCLA Harbor years, years earlier, 1975, took eight of these kids, admitted them to his uh, clinical research unit at UCLA Harbor, locked them up, threw away the key, and fed them 500 calories a day for a month. What do you think their weight did, Nick? Went up. How do you gain weight on 500 calories a day? Well, if you're basically, in, if we're talking about an obesogen if they're very obesogenic calories, then that would be the answer. No, it's because these kids made enormous amounts of insulin. Mm. These kids would rather store it than burn it. These kids had catecholamine levels at zero in their urine because their sympathetic nervous system was in absolute, um, uh, you know, uh, def zero default mode. Okay. And their insulin was driving everything they ate into fat. And the reason was because their fat made leptin. We didn't know about leptin back then, but their fat made leptin, but the leptin didn't work at the level of the brain. The brains thought they were starving because those neurons were dead. I see. So the and satiety so, signal wasn't getting through. The satiety signal and the energy sufficiency signal wasn't getting through. And therefore, these kids released enormous amounts of insulin to try to store more energy to get an energy signal through, but it would never go through because those neurons were dead from the tumor or the surgery or the radiation. So it was up to me to figure out what to do to help these kids. Now I knew from my neuroendocrine training that there was a connection between the hypothalamus and the pancreas that ran through the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve. So I knew that there was vagal output that was driving that insulin. And you could show that in animals very easily. And if you cut the vagus nerve, the animal stopped gaining weight, hmm. even though they had a hypothalamic lesion. So I said, well, I can't cut a vagus nerve. I'm not a surgeon, but can I do something as good? Can I give them a drug that will suppress insulin release? So we did a pilot trial in these kids, eight kids, where we gave them a drug that suppressed insulin release called octreotide. And lo and behold, they lost weight. And most importantly, not only did they lose weight, but they started exercising spontaneously. Mm. And how, how obese were they? Were they extremely obese? 300, 400 pounds. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they lost weight just as fast as they were gaining it. And they would say things like, this is the first time my head hasn't been in the cloud since the tumor. And the parents would say, I've got my kid back. Because these were kids who sat on the couch, ate Doritos and slept. Mm -hmm. They chose not to engage with society because they felt like crap. Because they had no energy to burn. And now, because we blocked their insulin, they did have energy to burn. One kid became a competitive swimmer. Two kids started lifting weights at home. One kid became the manager of his high school basketball team, running around collecting all the basketballs. Okay. These are kids who were lumps on a log. We changed their behavior because we changed their biochemistry. We got the insulin down and they started losing weight. Mm -hmm. And 
they started burning energy faster. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the wider lesson there is, you know, these are kids who had, you know, tumors and, you know, it required a physician to come in and fix the problem, which is to get the insulin lower. But for everyone else, our insulin is often high because of our diet and we can take changes that. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly right. So, you know, people say, well, you know, that was great for these kids, but what are you going to do about everybody else? Well, everyone else has super high insulin. Our insulin levels are two to four times higher than they were 50 years ago. And it's because of our diet. So if you fix our diet, you get the insulin down and now you have it to burn. And that's why body temperature has gone down is because our insulin is high because if you're storing it, then you're not burning it. And therefore your body temperature goes down. So the second model is the carbohydrate insulin model. Okay. Carbohydrate drives insulin, insulin drives weight gain, irrespective of total calories. So the energy balance model and the carbohydrate insulin model, they've been fighting it out. And by the way, they've been fighting it out right at Harvard Medical School. And I used to be a proponent of the carbohydrate insulin model. I was, you know, uh, on that train as well. And the reason was because of this work I had done with the kids, because I knew that the insulin was the driver. But you know what? That model doesn't explain the epigenetics. It doesn't explain the obese newborn. It doesn't explain the things that change in utero. So there was still something else that needed to be added. And so this paper that I have referred to, the Heindel paper, what we've done is we've assembled all of the models that currently exist, the energy balance model, the carbohydrate insulin model, another model, a third model, which is very important called the redox model. So oxidation reduction. So reactive oxygen species. So every cell has an energy pathway, has to because you got to make ATP. Every cell has enzymes that regulate that energy pathway. And every energy pathway checkpoint is a kinase. In other words, it has to be phosphorylated. And so it is subject to reactive oxygen species, and it is also subject to pH to determine whether or not those kinases are phosphorylated to direct energy one direction or direct energy in another direction. And it turns out when you look at the data that's in the literature, okay, when cells become depleted of energy, the kinases change in order to re-replete energy. And if you all if you block that, then it doesn't happen. So those and those are e- intracellular. So it has nothing to do with hormones. It has to do with what's happening inside each cell. But it turns out that all the different organs have different responses. So the brain has a different response that causes more food intake and more insulin release. The liver has a response that causes more de novo lipogenesis, more fat making. Okay, The pancreas has one that releases more insulin. So all of the different phenomena that occur in each of the different organs are all lined up to promote adiposity together or not or the opposite, or to burn the energy and not eat together. So it looks like the behaviors are all conglomerated. The gluttony and the sloth are conglomerated together, but they're actually all because of changes in cellular physiology that are occurring simultaneously due to the changes in these biochemical checkpoints, which are subject to reactive oxygen species. And as long as the reactive oxygen species stay low, you can burn. When they start getting high, that tells the cell it's got a store because it can't handle it. So it actually makes physiologic and teleologic sense that this would be a control point. And then the obesogen model is the fourth model. And it turns out that almost all the obesogens generate reactive oxygen species. Mm-hmm. So that's why those two fit together so well. They fit together very well. Mm-hmm. And so they so the the re, the redox obesogen together model 
actually explain both the carbohydrate insulin model because it's driving the insulin and that also explains the energy balance model too because of the eating and burning so in fact it's really a unifying hypothesis that brings all the models together but it actually identifies the ROSs as the thing to target and so now the question is can we set up a research experiment to answer that question and we're in the process of doing that now mm-hmm. I want to, in, in the, just the few minutes that we have left, I want to ask you about a, a striking relationship that I've heard people attempt to explain, but I'm wondering if you have a better explanation that might involve things like reactive oxygen species, mitochondria, and obesogens. And that is the striking correlation, at least in the continental US, between geography and in particular altitude and obesity rates. Um, yeah. Everyone looks at Colorado, which I believe has the the lowest obesity rates or among the lowest. And typically the, the default answer there is, well, you know, people move to Colorado because they love the outdoors and they go hiking a lot. Yep. (laughs) What's going on? Right. So everybody thinks Colorado is less obese because they have a great lifestyle. Garbage. Colorado is less obese because it's cold and high. And every place that's cold and high has less obesity. The heat map on altitude and obesity are virtually identical. Another example is Switzerland versus Germany. Same, you know, sauce laden food, you know, you know, uh, was it Cubs, Cubs, Fleischmischlag, you know, um, but bottom line, uh, Germany's obese and Switzerland's not, and it's not because of skiing. It's because of altitude. Okay. Cause Switzerland's high and Germany's not. So what's happening? Well, because you are in a rarefied atmosphere because you are mildly hypoxic you have to push your mitochondria harder to generate more atp because the oxygen tension is lower so you need more mitochondria so in the same way exercise generates mitochondria which is true it does and i'm not saying exercise is bad it's good okay altitude generates mitochondria and exercise at altitude, well, that's great. You know, <laughs> then then you're an alpine skier, okay, and that, that that's fine, <laughs> okay. But for the rest of us mere mortals, okay, altitude basically does what exercise does in terms of generating increased mitochondrial um, capacity, and that's why Colorado is less obese, also because it's colder, so you have to generate more body heat in the first place, so. It's not that Colorado is not less obese. It is. It's the question is, is the reason because of an active lifestyle? And the answer is no, it's not because of an active lifestyle. It's because of the geography, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the altitude. Another way of saying that would be you could transport someone um, f- from somewhere else, you know, say Louisiana into Colorado, change nothing about their lifestyle, nothing about their exercise or eating habits, and, and you would expect them to actually lose weight? Yeah, Exactly. You expect them to lose weight. Um, this concept of hypoxia reducing um, uh, energy uh, function, uh, uh, energy utilization, and actually contributing to longevity has actually been shown in animals. So, if you actually expose animals to hypoxic regimens, like instead of twenty percent oxygen, eleven percent oxygen, okay, they live three times longer. This was work done by a colleague here at UCSF by the name of Isha Jane. You know, looking at uh, the role of hypoxia in longevity. And the reason is because of reduction in reactive oxygen species formation. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all internally consistent. Ultimately, yeah. you got to make your mitochondria work better. Yeah, so much of it comes comes down to the mitochondria. I think it knowing does. everything I know today, you know, if, if I had to go back and, and go through school again, and go through the uh, academic science track, I think I would probably study something about mitochondria, probably in the brain, because I, I think that's just a fascinating area and an important one right now. I couldn't agree more, Nick. Uh, you know, I've, I, I've become a, uh, you know, a self-taught mitochondriologist, and um, it's hard. It, it's it's complex to be, to be sure. But, you know, the data are coming in from various uh you know, directions uh, and, you know, different places in science demonstrating that mitochondrial function is perhaps, you know, the 
single most important nidus for understanding the diseases that ail us. You know, mm -hmm. that this is really where the where the rubber hits the road. I, I refer you to a, a colleague at University of California, San Diego, by the name of Robert Navio, N-A-V-I-A-U-X. And he has done enormous work on reactive oxygen species, external ATP to the cell and the inflammatory response and how mitochondria fit into all of that. It's, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, shall we say a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Um, we've just got a couple minutes left, so I'm going to do a very simple question, um, that is very practical for people, but given so, so health and nutrition and metabolism, it's sort of inherently difficult area. Uh, and I don't just mean like the, the subject matter is complicated, but um, there's a lot of motivated reasoning. There's a lot of conflicting opinions, even among credentialed experts. And you know, when you couple that to the proliferation of information that our technology has enabled, you know, you can go watch a podcast with any number of people, and there's going to be some level of mutually contradictory information out there. When it comes to <laughs> when it comes to metabolic health and you know, the science of that general area, who are, I don't know, two or three or four names for people that are out there that are, you know, on podcasts, on the internet, writing books or whatever that you think are uh, mostly right or directionally that are worth following for people other than yourself. Um, aside from myself. Um, so I think David Perlmutter, he's gotten a bad rap and I think it's totally undeserved. Uh, he, he's a neurologist who wrote Grain Brain but is totally on board with this no notion and uh, mitochondria being sort of the, at the, at the, you know, uh, focal point of uh, cellular physiology, Rick Johnson, Richard Johnson at the uh, university of Colorado uh, is also, you know, uh, uh, totally on this and uh, uh, has written about fructose and Alzheimer's and he wrote a book called white nature wants us to be fat. And the last person that I would refer you to is Christopher Palmer right there at Harvard. He's at McLean. He's a psychiatrist and he is going to explode the field of metabolic psychiatry. There are other metabolic psychiatrists, Shabani Seti at, uh, at Stanford and, um, uh, Georgia Ead at, uh, also at Harvard. Uh, there, uh, you know, so there are other people in that field too, but Christopher's just done the most. And he's the one who's shown that basically a ketogenic diet can reverse bipolar uh, disorder because it is a biochemical problem, not a behavioral one. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really quite remarkable when, when mm -hmm. you see the data and when you hear the stories, it's, it's, it's so uplifting. I would anything, say that, anything else you want to reiterate for people, um, that we talked about? You can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is. Okay. And we've been, we've gotten the problem wrong for the last 50 years because we were told it was fat wrong got to fix it. But unfortunately, the food industry doesn't want to fix it. So we, we have a lot of work to do. All right, Robert Lustig, uh, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. Nick. Appreciate it. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D 
is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase.